Well, it's good to be out and good to see everyone out and we're delighted for the presence of all. We invite you to get your Bibles out, get your electronic Bible out, Bible out of the pew, but do follow along as we study from the scriptures. We'll begin our study here in the book of Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, and uh, we'll be studying that text. It's one of the great texts of the New Testament and just a, just a marvelous, very rich in meaning as uh, Jesus promised to build his church. As uh, I mentioned, we do have folks from uh, down at uh, Mill Street. Good to see Bernice and uh, Blaine with us here tonight. And good to see everybody out. And uh, we hope that our time will be profitable and beneficial in every way. Here in uh, Matthew chapter 16, let's begin by reading this text. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say, you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, King James says hell, Hades is the preferred, is the correct, uh, is the correct word, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shall be loosed on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. We title our lesson, Upon This Rock. That's the title of our lesson, Upon This Rock. Upon this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church. So let's begin by just kind of a map of where this teaching took place. Uh, that is in Caesarea Philippi, very near Mount Hermon. You see there's a little bit of space between Mount Hermon there above Caesarea Philippi. And there's a reason why there's a little bit of space because that's showing the peak because Mount Hermon's a pretty good sized mountain. In fact, it's the tallest mountain in the land of Israel. Mount Hermon, uh, the peak stands at 9,232 feet. And like other mountains that are high during the winter, it receives a lot of snow and all that melts and runs down, of course, to ultimately to the, to, the, uh, to the Sea of Galilee, which then flows into the uh, River Jordan, which then flows ultimately into the Dead Sea, what water is left over. But Caesarea Philippi is kind of near the base of Mount, uh, Mount Hermon. And this is believed by most people where Jesus was doing the teaching here in Matthew chapter 16, Caesarea Philippi. Now, it's interesting, uh, the other day I was, uh, uh, one of the nice things about cellular, uh, in the, the, uh, like the King James has the number and you can just click on the number and you can get the definition. But I clicked on Philippi and it's kind of an interesting term. It means a lover of horses. So horses was a pretty big thing, and there's still a lot of people that enjoy horses even today. But Caesarea Philippi is where this teaching took place that uh, is found here in Matthew chapter 16. Now, let's look at these questions and the answers. Uh, they're kind of interesting. The first question uh, there in verse 13, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What are, what are people saying about me? Jesus asked the disciples. I mean, they're out in the community. Jesus was kind of a pretty big personality kind of kind of became famous of all the great things he was doing and so the question is what are men saying about me and they had of course different answers but that's kind of a kind of a strange question you you wouldn't ask that about probably anybody here you wouldn't say well who are people what are people saying about uh a wine community well probably not or what are people saying about brain what are people saying about you know roger that doesn't make a lot of sense, but if you're talking about Jesus, and you know that he was a pretty famous person, he's a very special person, well, that question does make a lot of sense. Well, what are they saying about me? Well, as you look in the next verse, they had different answers as they would hear different things as they were out. Of course, being associated with Jesus, and maybe people would recognize that they were uh, Jesus' disciples. And some were saying, John the Baptist. That is, John the Baptist raised from the dead. John was beheaded, as you learned back from the uh, previous chapter there in the book of Matthew. And some say, well, he's Elijah. There was the promise of the coming of Elijah, which was really there in the book of Malachi. It was actually a prophecy 
of John the Baptist, and you read about that on down in chapter 16, uh, that uh, Elijah, that, uh, that this Elijah wasn't the literal Elijah, but somebody liked the personality of Elijah, and that was John the Baptist. And others were saying, well, maybe he's Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, certainly all these characters are great men of God. Whether you talk about Jeremiah, you talk about Elijah, you talk about John the Baptist or one of the prophets, I mean, they were, they, were, they were really men of great character, men of great faith, and I guess that would be sort of a compliment but uh, for most anybody be called after one of these fellows, but really Jesus is even more than that. So the first question is, well, what are people thinking? And they have all kinds of different answers. And then he says, well, what do you think about me? Kind of turning to the disciples, kind of wanting to see what their viewpoint was. And so what, do you, what are you all thinking about me? And, of course, you have Peter's answer recorded there in verse 16 when he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah. You're the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament, the one that was to come, the anointed one, and uh, that was talked about in various texts in the Old Testament. We believe you're the Christ. You're the promised one, the anointed one that was to come from Jehovah and uh, the Son of the living God which is really a confession of the deity of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Was Jesus man? Yeah, Jesus was man. He was in a tabernacle of flesh. But he was God in the flesh. His name is called Emmanuel, meaning, the interpretation, God with us. And so it was God, he was man, but he was also God. When you looked at him, he was just looked like a mere man. But on the inside, the interior part, he was deity. Uh, as you read there in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. That is the part of the eternal Godhead, the Word of the Son, Jesus, He was made flesh. He took upon a tabernacle of flesh, and uh, which was quite a step down in uh, humility and lowliness and certainly serves a great uh, pattern and lesson for us. So that was Peter's answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus points out in verse 17 that this was a matter of divine revelation. Notice what it says there again. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or Simon, son of Jonah, Bar meaning son of, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. You didn't sit down and figure this on your own. You didn't go confer with some earthly teacher or some human wisdom to get this figured out. No, it was a matter of divine revelation. He says, but my Father which is in heaven, he revealed this, that you are the Christ, that you are the Son of the living God. And so the affirmation that it was divine revelation. We wouldn't know about Jesus. We wouldn't know a lot of things about God unless God revealed it. I mean, we can look at creation and we see that creation testifies there's a creator. Absolutely. The power and the magnificence and the greatness of God, that God created the world. It couldn't be by a cosmic accident. It couldn't be by dumb luck and, and blind chance, which, which the, the theory of evolution, the general theory of evolution teaches, that it was some sort of cosmic accident that we're here and all the variety of life. No, it was a, an intelligent creator that created the world. It is like any number of things. You could talk about this remote presenter. You could talk about this remote control for the projector. You could talk about this extension cord. You could talk about this computer. And probably has anybody, did anybody see human beings make this little gizmo here? Anyway, go ahead. Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand if you've seen anybody make this presenter. Well, no, I didn't either. But we all would look at that and say, well, yeah, there were men that made that. Why? Well, because of the design, because of, of the symmetry and, and the functionality of it. It couldn't be by accident. It couldn't be that there was lava just sort of pouring out and it just sort of melted various metals and when it cooled, lo and behold, we've got a presenter. It doesn't happen that way. We look at, we look at the, the, uh, the object itself and it is testimony. I mean, absolute testimony. If anybody that, that has a reasonable mind, an honest mind, says, well, yeah, human beings made that. And anybody that has any kind of integrity will look at the creation, look at the things that are made, whether you want to talk about plants, you want to talk about animals, you want to talk about the human body, you want to talk about whatever, trees. You have to say, well, there has to be an intelligent designer. It doesn't happen by accident. Absolutely, it couldn't. And so God reveals himself. But there are a lot of things we don't know about God unless we have the divine revelation 
That is, um, what God's will is. And so it was that God had revealed this information that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then we come to that great promise in verse 18. That great promise described there in verse 18. When he says, I say unto thee, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. All right, first off, let's talk about our Catholic friends. In the Roman Catholic Church, the reasoning goes sort of like this. Well, Peter, his name means rock, and so Jesus says that you are Peter, you're rock, and upon this rock, that is you being the first pope, I'm going to build my church, and there's going to be a whole succession of popes, and they're going to be very intricate in, 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 the, in the church and, and built upon the papacy, and Peter being the first pope. That, that's the reasoning that they give. Well, let me show you why that's just not so. It just, it just doesn't fit. All right, first off, when you talk about the term Peter, yes, it comes from the New Testament word Petros. And it does mean a rock or a stone. And then when Jesus says upon this rock, you see it's very similar, but you see it's also a little bit different. The word that's translated rock upon this rock is the word Petra. It's a little bit different. I mean, it's... It's obvious just looking at it. Now, what, what is the difference? How would we explain the difference? Well, let me just use a couple of pictures and we'll explain the difference between Petros, Peter, and Rock, Petra. All right? Here is Petros, a stone. And then here is Petra. Now, when you look at the actual material of this rock and the material of that rock, probably limestone, it's the same exact chemical composition when you talk about a Petros or a Petra. But what's the difference? It's pretty obvious what the difference is. This, this uh, if you ever go down to Cumberland Falls and you walk down the, <clears throat> to get the view of the lower falls and you walk on down the river, this is the Cumberland River, and it's just right below Cumberland Falls, you've got this big, massive rock. And it's been there. I've been there three or four times, and it's still in the same place. And sometimes the Cumberland River gets high when there's a lot of rain. It comes flowing down, and you can see the evidence. You can see all that driftwood, but you know what? That rock stays pretty steady, pretty firm. Even when you got a lot of wood, you got a lot of water crashing against it, that rock doesn't move. That's the point of Petra, something that kind of, kind of this big, big rock that's very firm and steady. And the point is that the church would be built upon like this big massive rock that's unshakable, a very, very sound foundation. That, that's the imagery that we should get across. So when you talk about Petros, you're talking about this. That, that would be Peter. You talk about upon this rock Petra, that you would think of this imagery in the first century. Now let me give you more evidence why our Catholic friends are, are incorrect in their reasoning. It has to do with the confession that Peter made. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is confessing the deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it's upon this confession, the deity of Jesus Christ, that the church would be built, which is a very solid foundation, an immovable foundation. And this idea of rock is quite interesting because when you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, I want you to notice how the word rock is used. If you open your Bibles there to Deuteronomy chapter 32, you're going to see an interesting contrast. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, <clears throat> notice there, uh, verse uh, 15. It says, but Jeshurun, that's a kind of a poetic name of uh, Israel, but Jeshurun uh, waxed fat and kicked. Uh, thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Uh, then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed, now notice, the rock of his salvation. Israel forsook the rock of their salvation. And if you notice that word rock, it's a capital R. It refers to Jehovah God. It refers to the deity of Jehovah. Now notice there in verse 18. Although it's a capital R. He says, Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. So rock, here in Deuteronomy 32, the capital R refers to Jehovah, that is the deity, the divinity of God. Then notice down there in number 31. 
for their rock, that is talking about the Gentiles, the people the, uh, uh, of the nations, for their rock, now that's a small r, for their rock is not as our rock, a capital R. You see the contrast? Their rock, small r, the false deities, the false gods, plural gods, he says, for their rock is not our rock, even our enemies themselves being judged. Then look down there in number 37. And he shall say, where are their gods, plural gods, that is the various gods of paganism, the various gods of the, uh, of the various nations, which is really no more than go to the and the three bears. They're just fairy tales. They're make-believe. It's like Superman. It's like Batman. The Avenger. I mean, these are all just comic book characters. They don't really exist. They're only in the minds of people. And so whether you talk about Jupiter or Zeus or Isis or Horus or, or Baal or Asheroth, whatever the false gods, plural, of the Gentiles, it uses their rock in whom they trusted. You see the contrast? Rock, capital R, refers to deity, divinity. The small r, rock, refers to the, uh, to the gods, the figments of people's imagination in paganism. So there's a sharp contract. And it's in that imagery that the Jews would be very familiar with when he says upon this rock, what, G what Peter confessed about Jesus died to Christ, the Son of the living God, the divinity, the deity of Jesus Christ. The church was going to be built upon Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. He is the solid rock. That massive rock that we used in the illustration. Let me back up there. This big massive rock that's unmovable, unshakable. And the church is built upon this foundation that is unshakable. I mean, what would it take to move a big rock like that? Well, we can get a lot of people being pushing against it, and I don't think it's going to move. It's pretty solid. I mean, you can have floodwaters coming down and trees and all this other stuff <laughs> crashing against it, and it don't move. Well, the point is that the church is built upon a very solid foundation that is the divinity, the deity of Jesus Christ. Let's look at some more evidence that the rock that the church is built upon has to refer uh, refers to Jesus Christ, not to the so-called power claimed by our Roman Catholic friends. Notice there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. You see, the foundation of the church that Jesus promised to build would be resting upon his divinity, his deity, that Peter was confessing. This is the solid foundation. It's not going to be moved. It's not going to be shaken. It's not going to be come tumbling down. You rock the foundation while well, the building just comes tumbling down. Well, we, we rest upon a solid foundation. The church of our Lord Jesus Christ rests upon the solid foundation. Now notice something else our text tells us there in verse 18. Jesus says, I will build my church. That's future tense. Not past tense. Now, I have built in the past. Not that uh, I am now building, present tense, no, I will build my church. Now, what's kind of interesting, we have some of the denominations, one in particular, that wants to say, well, you know, the church here was kind of built in the days of John the Baptist. John the ba Baptist. We were talking with a lady, she said, well, you know, really, the church was kind of built in the days of John the Baptist, or so it gives credence to, to the denominational name, Baptist Church. And so if you kind of get it back there with John, it sort of gives a little bit more biblical credence to their existence and them taking the name Baptist. Well, no, it doesn't work. John's dead. Church wasn't built the day of John. Because Jesus is talking here. John's already been beheaded. And he's saying in the future, he says, I will build my church. And then there's something else as we look at our text there in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. He says, Thy Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Did you notice that? I will build my church. Singular. Now, sometimes people don't like to hear the idea of my church. Singular. The oneness of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't like to hear that. 
But that's what the text says. He says, I will build my church. He says, I will build my churches. He says, I will build my church. That is, in the universal sense, his people all over the world, members of the same congregation, members of the same church. Now, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, wait, 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 over there. In Revelation 2 or 3, it talks about the seven churches of Asia. Or Galatians chapter 1 talks about the churches of Galatia. Well, what, what about that? What, 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 what about that? We have plurality of churches. Well, the answer to that is pretty easy. You turn over to the first, first Corinthians chapter 4. Look at number 17. Because what folks are trying to do in referring to plurality of local congregation, well, that's kind of like we have all the denominations today, and they were just like all the denominations uh, that we have today were kind of like back in the first century because it talks about a plurality of congregations. Well, the problem is folks don't study the Bible very carefully. Yeah, there were a plurality of local congregations. But in order to have denominationalism, you'd have to have, well, Paul teaching, well, you can sprinkle for baptism, and then over this other congregation, well, you can immerse, and then this other congregation, they would talk about, well, you, you can pour for baptism. And then in, in a local congregation, well, you have Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, and this other one say, well, you'd have the Lord's Supper once a month, and this other one say, well, you'd have the Lord's Supper every quarter, and then another one say, well, you can just have it once a year. And that's how you would have to justify denominationalism with the plurality of local congregations, but it won't fit. Because look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, number 17. Paul says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ. Now notice this. Now notice, he says, Where in every church. When Paul went to one congregation, he taught the same doctrine. When he went to another local congregation, he taught the same doctrine. And he went to another congregation, he was teaching the same doctrine, the same teaching. It was the same truth in every local congregation. That's what the, te well, that's what the passage tells us. And so trying to justify human denominationalism, it will not fit with the scriptures. It's just wrong. I mean, people want to want to try to justify, but it's not justifiable because Jesus prayed for unity. The Bible talks about oneness. When you have plurality of all congregations, they were all taught the same thing. So you don't you don't have denominationalism like it is today. It's totally different than what was taught in the New Testament. So Jesus says, "Upon this rock I will build my church," and then He says, "The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it." Now, what in the world is all that talking about? As I mentioned, the King James uses and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You look at most every other translation, the more accurate translation, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So now what does this mean? What, what is this talking about? Well, first off, what is Hades? Well, Hades is the place of disembodied spirits. When people die, according to James chapter 2 and verse 26, when death happens, the word death itself fundamentally means separation. It's like when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, they died that very day. That is, they were separated from God. Physically they were living, but they were separated from God because that's the definition of the word death, is separation. Now, when people die physically, what do you have? Well, you have a separation of the outward man. That's the tabernacle of flesh. What we what we see that's made from the dust, and you have the inward man, and you have this separation that is the inward man, the soul of the spirit, which is used uh, uh, many, many times interchangeably, talking about the inward man, there is the separation, and so the body, it goes to the grave, and it returns to dust from whence it came, and then the spirit returns to God, that is, it comes under God's control, and then he places it in this realm called Hades, the place of disembodied spirits. That's a generic term. Both the good and the bad go there. From Luke 16, we learn that there are like two sides to it, and there's a great gulf that divides the two. And that is, you have a place of comfort, described as Abraham's bosom, where good people go, righteous people go, and then the bad side, the wicked and the uh, rebellious, where they go, their spirits go uh, to this place called Hades. Now, the thing about when people die and the body is buried and the spirit goes to Hades, there's gates. So gates are what? Well, it's like a door. You in, enter into this. But they're kind of like, uh, when you talk about the gates of Hades, they're kind of like these one-way turnstiles. Maybe like at Rupp Arena or some other 
public facilities. You go in, you see, it says entry. So you go in, but those other bars, it only turns one way, so you can go in, but it doesn't rotate the other way around. So you go in, but you can't come out. You just, you're not strong enough. There's nobody strong enough that could enter in and then just like bend those bars and just come waltzing back out. Oh, those gates are pretty strong. And so it is when you talk about the gates of Hades. I mean, I've met and seen a lot of people pass away, preached a lot of different funerals, and those folks are still in the grave. They haven't come forth from the Hadean realm. They don't have the strength. They enter in. So when people die, it's sort of like, well, that's it. When it comes to the things here on planet Earth, all their, all their dreams and all their actions just sort of comes to, uh, to, to a grinding stop. Human beings don't have the power to uh, overcome these gates. They're pretty strong. They're one way. You enter in or else you don't come out. Well, Jesus, when he died, you remember as he hangs on the cross, and he says, Father, into thy, into, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and, and he breathes his life, and his spirit also went to Hades, Acts chapter 2, about verse uh, 30 and 33, talks about that. But now there's something different about Jesus. Jesus entered into Hades, but Jesus came forth. It's like you might have great plans. You know, you might save up money and you might get an architect and you've got plans to build this house. It's your dream house and you're working on this and something happens, you have a heart attack, you're in a car accident, you die. Well, what happens to all those plans? Well, they kind of like come to naught. You die and those plans sort of die with the person that had all these great plans. Well, what about Jesus? Right? He had great plans. He said, I'm going to build my church. Well, he dies. And his spirit goes to Hades. Now, does his plans come to naught? I mean, all the dreams? I mean, the apostles, they sort of felt that away when Jesus died. I mean, just kind of took them back of him dying. I mean, he told them he was going to die. He told them he was going to raise. But they it sort of whoop, kind of went over their head. And so they're pretty down in the mouth about the about Jesus being crucified and being laid in the in the tomb, and they're all down and out about it. Well, what about Jesus' plans? He said, "I'm going to build my church." All right, well, he died. Well, I guess those plans are all for naught. No, no. Jesus says, "The gates of Hades shall not prevail against." Why? Because Jesus triumphantly comes forth from the grave. He is resurrected from the dead. These gates were not strong enough to hold him. And when you study the New Testament, what's interesting, it talks about God raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit was involved in raising Jesus from the dead. And Jesus himself was involved in his own resurrection. And he says, now explain that. Well, I don't know. I just know that's what the fact, that's what the facts say. And, but all three persons of the Godhead were involved in the resurrection of Jesus. And these gates, now for human beings, you know, and physically, like a rubber ring or someplace like that, you know, we're not strong enough to overcome these kind of gates. We go in and we're not coming back out. I mean, that's just the facts of life. Now, if you were to fly, you could just fly right through them. But if you're a being, you're not going to get through these gates. You can go in, but you can't come out. But Jesus went into the gates of Hades, the Hadean realm, the place of disembodied spirits. But what happened? It did not prevail. It did not stop him from his resurrection because on that third day, that early Sunday morning, the early first day of the week, he came forth from the grave. A powerful, powerful miracle takes place is that he comes forth from the grave triumphant over death in order to finish carrying out the promise upon this rock, I will build my church. And he did just that. That he accomplished his purpose of building his church. And it all began after he showed himself for 40 days. He ascended back on high to sit down at the right hand of God. There was a day of enthronement of his coronation. A great celebration, no doubt, in heaven. And then, on the day of Pentecost, the preaching of the gospel, people were invited to come and partake and be a part of the church that Jesus promised to build. And from the day of Pentecost and after, it's always spoken of, when you talk about the church of the king, all spoken of in the present tense. So he accomplished his purpose. He accomplished his promise. The gates of Hades did not stop. It did not prevail and stop him from accomplishing his purpose to build my church. And so beginning of the day of Pentecost and now in 2018 we're still preaching the same message. That we can be a part of this church that Jesus promised to build. 
and that we can be a part of the church, of the blood-bought institution called the church that is resting upon a very solid foundation that is the divinity and the deity of Jesus Christ. I mean, who's going to shake the foundations of the church? Who could? I mean, who, who's going to be able to come up against God and push Him out of the way? Now, you might be in a crowd of people, and you might be able to push some people out of the way to get your way, to, to make your way through a crowd. But who's going to push God? Push Him out of the way? Nobody. That's why the church is, is, is resting upon this solid foundation that is Jesus is the Christ of the Son of the living God. And so everything that He promised to the church, which we can be a part of, it's all going to come to pass. We might wonder, well, how's He going to do it? Don't have, don't have to know how He's going to do it. We just know that He is going to do it. How's He going to raise everybody from the dead? Well, He just has the power to do that. He has demonstrated His power, and He promised that He's going to raise us from the dead. And for those that serve Him, He's going to grant unto us life eternal. He's going to say, Come, ye blessed my Father, and have the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And when He makes promises like that, well, you can surely bank on it, because He has the power to carry out His promises. It was kind of a downtime when Jesus was crucified. The disciples all down the mouth about it. Let me tell you something. The power of the resurrection convinced them and they went out and they preached the truth. And they didn't let anybody stop them. Even when they were threatened and even when they were killed, they didn't stop because they knew this was the truth. Jesus is the Christ. And He did build His church. And then notice there at number 19, the promise. And Jesus says, And I will give unto thee all right, so he's talking to Peter. still talking to Peter. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose, loosed in heaven. Now, our Catholic friends say, Aha, see, see right there. See, Peter's, Jesus give Peter all the special authority to bind and to loose. Give him the keys of the kingdom. Well, the problem with that is this binding and loosing. Yeah, he was talking to Peter. But if you flip over about a page in your Bible to Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, it says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth, ye is the... I like King James when it says ye because it means you all, in plural. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. He's talking to all the apostles. So the authority that Peter had to bind and loose, well, it was given to all the apostles. They had the power to bind and they had the power to loose. Like, for instance, they would say, okay, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of Israel. Well, that's bound by the apostles. That's just the way it is. It's got to be that way. We have Acts 20, verse 7. We have apostolic example of the early Christians meeting upon the first day of the week. That's binding. That's why we have the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. You have 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 and 2, that gives us the divine pattern of when the collection is made, and that is upon the first day of every week. And that's why we do have a collection on the first day of the week. You notice we haven't taken up a collection out any night this week during the weekdays. Why? Because there's no authority for that. The pattern is that we do it on the first day of the week. So the apostles, they have the authority to bind, not in and of themselves, but what was bound in heaven, they communicated that and revealed that, and they, of course, have that uh, apostolic authority. That's why the, the book of Acts says, in Acts 2 and verse 42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It's not that the apostles emanated and created this doctrine themselves. It's what by divine inspiration that they gave and reveal and we follow it because that's what the, the will of God shows us and teaches us. So what we learn is that the apostles had the power to bind, but they also had the power to loose. Such as the Sabbath day is no longer binding. Colossians chapter 2. The handwriting of ordinances were nailed to the cross. And he goes on to talk about Sabbath days and new moons and other uh, various meats. We don't have those restrictions. We don't have the Sabbath day being bound upon us. The dietary restrictions of not eating certain kinds of meat, those things are not bound upon us. They were loosed by the apostles. And so the apostles had that authority. They're the ones that bound and they're the ones that loose. And that's why we're always turning to the apostolic uh, teachings that are revealed, recorded in the pages of inspiration of what we call the Bible, because they're the ones that had the power to bind and to loose. They were the ones that were the spokesmen for Jesus Christ. They were the ambassador to give this divine message. And we follow. That's why we're always appealing to book, chapter, and verse. 
That's why we're always appealing to the Word of God. That it is complete. That it is God's Word. That it's the infallible Word of God. That it is the incorruptible Word of God. Because that's what the Bible affirms about itself. And that's what I believe. And the evidence certainly demands that. Because that's what the Bible teaches. And that's why we're just always appealing to Scriptures. And what the Scriptures teach. And what they say. Because what it says really... It's the apostles speaking, but they're speaking because the Holy Spirit inspired them, and the Holy Spirit was speaking through them because Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, and we listen to the Holy Spirit, we listen to the apostles and the Holy, the, who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, who were sent by Jesus, and Jesus was sent by the Father, so you see the divine chain of authority comes down, that emanating from God, speaking to humanity, in the Scriptures is the mind and the counsel and the wisdom of God. It is the voice of God. And our responsibility is to listen and to obey Jehovah God, the true and living God. And so it is a tremendous, tremendous promise that are given here. And so the invitation of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is open. If you're here and you're not a member of Christ's church, the church that he promised to build, you could do that even this evening. Jesus says, I'll build my church. He built it. It's in existence. And you can become a part of this church. And all the blessings that comes with being a member of Christ's church. And how's that? Well, you got to step out in faith and obedience. The plan of redemption, the scheme of redemption is revealed in the Word. Being bound by the apostles. It's not that, well, we crawl on our hands and knees for a couple of miles and we pray to some statue for forgiveness. Oh, no, that's not the way it is. If that's what... If the apostles taught that, okay, we'd have to do that. But that's not what the apostles taught. The apostles teach us that we've got to hear the good news about Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. A tremendous, tremendous story. That Jesus, was, yeah, he was, he was crucified, yeah, He was killed, but He was buried and raised the third day. And He sent back on high. And that's where He now reigns. And if we believe in Him with all our heart, we'd be willing to repent at His command, to confess Him before men, and then to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, well, we can become a part, and He will add us to His church. He, uh, it says the Lord added uh, to the church, gave us as we should be saved. And so when we are saved, when we are reconciled through obedience to the scheme of redemption by giving our heart and life in faith and obedience, we are then added to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're baptized into His death, that we might be baptized into the benefits of His blood. We come up to rise to walk in newness of life. And then we're exhorted to be faithful unto death. Revelation 2 and verse 10. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24 and verse 13. So we've got to just stay the course. But sometimes Christians do err. And there's a second law uh, described in Acts 8 and verse 22. When Simon, who had obeyed the gospel, when he fell into sin, he was told to repent and pray God, and perhaps with all the heart may be forgiven thee. Now, the invitation. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. If you're laboring under the weight and the struggle of sin, Jesus is the solution. There's nobody else that has the solution for the problem of sin. There's no other way to get saved. There's no other way to find forgiveness except through Jesus Christ and His scheme, His teachings that are found in the New Testament given to us by the holy apostles and prophets who by inspiration gave us this message, this information. I didn't make this information up. I give verses. I give you more verses on every single one of these steps. But you have to do it. I can't do it for you. I, I did it for me because I want to be saved. I did it for me because I want to go to heaven. I did it for me because I want to be a part of the church that Jesus promised to build. I did it for me because I don't want to be lost in eternity. I don't want to wind up in eternal destruction. So I accepted these, these principles and these teachings from Jesus and keep trying to serve the Lord. Why? Because the promise is to the faithful and that's what I want to be. I want to be faithful. Am I perfect? No, I'm not perfect. But I want to be faithful to the Lord. I want to be a servant of Jesus Christ because the ramification of the promises of Jesus Christ are everlasting. Saved from everlasting destruction and receiving everlasting life. You see, it sort of goes hand in hand. If you're saved from destruction, you have the promise of everlasting life. If you don't have the promise of everlasting life, you're doomed for destruction. I mean, that's just the way it goes. It's one place or the other. So we each have to make up our own mind. And if you see the message, you see the value of Jesus Christ, and you see the value of His promises, and we can assist you to obey whatever is necessary to make your life right, we're here ready. We're here ready. So we're going to sing the song, The Great Physician. Jesus is that great physician, and He can bring healing if we will just believe and obey.
there's any way that we can help, you come and let us know. Why together as we stand, as we sing.